Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 14th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Uh, can I begin by expressing on behalf of the committee our deep condolences to the uh, family and friends of those who lost their lives in last night's evil attack on Manchester. Uh, we wish all those injured a speedy recovery and uh, offer our thoughts and prayers to everyone uh, affected. Uh, we also express our solidarity with the people of the great city of Manchester at this dark time. Um, later in our um, agenda, we'll have a session with representatives from the Scottish Ambulance Service. Uh, I think it's only right that at this time we put on record our appreciation and admiration for the work of the emergen <coughs> emergency services staff here and indeed across the world. The first item on our agenda is subordinate legislation. We have two negative instruments to consider. The first instrument is the <coughs> excuse me <coughs> is the National Assistance Assessment of Resources Amendment Scotland Regulations 2017. There has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comment on the instrument. Could I invite comments from members? Convener, if I may, um, I note in the papers that there's been some delay in these changes being <coughs> implemented, that normally they would be implemented from April, um, and that's been delayed until uh, the summer. Uh, could I propose that the committee writes to the Scottish Government to seek some um, clarification round about that, and also some clarification round about the, the changes to the payments, whether those will be backdated, etc. Okay, any other comments? Can we agree that that is before? Okay, that is agreed. Uh, the second instrument is the uh, National Assistance Sum for Personal Requirements, Scotland Regulations 2017. Again, there's been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comment on the instrument. Again, could I ask any comments from members? Sorry, convener, again, can I suggest that we also write in this matter to the Scottish Government seeking the same sort of information? Okay, uh, I assume we are agreed on that as well, yes? That is agreed. Thank you very much. Um, now we move on to Agenda Item 2, Scottish Ambulance Service, um, and we have an evidence session. Can I welcome to the committee uh, Pauline Howey, Chief Executive, Dr Dareth Clegg, Associate Medical Director, uh, Gerard O'Brien, Director of Finance and Logistics, and Paul Bassett, General Manager of the Scottish Ambulance Service. Uh, you're welcome to the committee. Um, could I ask Pauline to make an opening statement? Thank you, Convener. The Scottish Ambulance Service touches the lives of almost everyone in Scotland at one point or another. Every year we receive around 2 million calls for help, and a very small proportion of those are for people who are in immediate need of our services who, for example, are suffering from cardiac arrest. Increasingly, a number of um, unscheduled care presentations are increasing and we um, have a, a, a range of conditions and a range of different responses for patients in those circumstances. For example, elderly patients who have fallen, we have a range of different responses for those patients now. We also provide almost a million patients with help to and from their hospital appointments. We host the Scott Star Specialist Retrieval and Transport Service for the, the most acutely ill patients in Scotland that require transfer into specialist facilities. We host the Scottish Air Ambulance Service and we have special operations teams who respond to tragic events like the one in Manchester last night. And like you, convener, we'd like to place on, thought, on record our thoughts for all those that were affected by the tragedy in Manchester last night and our thanks to our emergency services colleagues, colleagues particularly those in, in North West Ambulance Service. The Scottish Ambulance Service is also changing. Like the rest of the NHS, we operate in the context of increasing demand for healthcare services, public services reform, tight financial budgets, an increasingly elderly population and a workforce who is getting older. We've listened to our staff, to the public and to our partners, and we've embarked on a significant period of transformation of our service, taking care to the patient. The reform programme means basing our service on clinical evidence and staff and patient experience. The aim is to provide care for patients where and when they need it, in the most appropriate setting that might not be in a hospital. Last year, we treated more than 100,000 patients at their home or in a homely setting where they want to be treated, and we also saved more lives from patients suffering from cardiac arrest. A reform programme means investing in equipment and technology, but fundamental to all is investing in our staff. 
We are developing our workforce through further education, development, the enhancement and addition of new roles and clinical skills for staff, and we are training 1,000 new paramedics by 2020. As we continue to introduce our new programme in the next phase of our clinical-based response model, we know that we've still got a lot to do. We're only part way through the reform programme. We also know how valuable it is for members to see our service firsthand, and it was great to see so many of the committee members out in our ambulance stations and ambulance control rooms recently, and of course we would welcome other committee members joining us to listen to staff and to hear and see for themselves firsthand the work that they do and the ideas that our staff have for further development of our services. We're pleased to come to the committee today to answer your questions, and we look for your support and further improvements in our service. We need to develop new models of care with and for communities that are sustainable, particularly in remote and rural locations. We need alternative transport options for those patients that don't require the skills of ambulance staff. And we need to continue to develop performance standards that matter to people. And people tell us the things that matter to them are improved positive outcomes and being treated with care and compassion. Thank you, convener. Hey, thanks very much for that. I wonder if I could ask um, you to reflect on um, the performance of the service um, uh, in, in general. Uh, how do you think the service is performing? Well, as I mentioned, Convener, we're partway through a significant period of reform of our, of our service, and that uh, reform is based on the best clinical evidence that we've got available to us. As I mentioned in my introduction, we are saving more lives, um, and we are developing our staff so that they can perform care in different settings. The experience that of our staff and of our, of our patients is that um, for people that phone 999, a different range of responses is required. Sometimes that's not an ambulance at all. Sometimes it's referral to other parts of the health and social care system. And that's why we're investing in our ambulance control centres and upskilling the staff in there and uh, developing new roles within the ambulance control centres and investing in the staff that uh, you see driving about our cities and our towns as, as well so that they can take more care to, to patients. There's almost always more to do um, and we've got a very detailed corporate plan this year that will see us continuing to invest in, in the staff and to develop new care models and new care pathways with our partners. Gareth, do you want to say a little bit more about the, the evidence base for the changes? Sure. I, um, I think there are, there are two things that would be good to say at this point about um, performance of the service. And one is to pick up what Pauline's mentioned about out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest is a good condition to use as an indicator because it really is at the top of the acuity pyramid. Um, after someone's heart stops in the community, there are only a few minutes in which we can intervene to do something to save the life uh, before someone dies. And um, it came to our attention uh, over the last few years that actually Scotland doesn't do terribly well in the league table uh, internationally in terms of survival after <coughs> out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, only one in 20 of the 3,000 or so resuscitations that are performed every year in Scotland will result in a survivor going home to their family. And that's in contrast with other countries like uh, parts of Scandinavia where as many as one in four people will go home. So in recognition of this, uh, Maureen Watt last year launched um, Scotland's strategy for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And the Scottish Ambulance Service have been at the centre of this strategy, um, chairing the committee with all the other emergency services, third sector organisations, academia and so on, that have put together a programme including aims and pledges and undertakings to improve things over the next uh, four years now, five years then, up to 2020. And we hope to improve survival to the extent that we're saving an additional 300 lives a year after cardiac arrest. So this, I think, highlights some important things about the ambulance service. Firstly, that we are keen to be proactive and at the centre of changes which will uh, result in positive patient outcomes, that we're willing to engage with all the partners uh, in the community that want to do this. So these are um, community groups, other emergency services, third sector organisations and academia and so on. And we're willing to collect the, the data and the resource in order to push things forward. And as things stand, as Pauline alluded to, we have seen an increase in the number of patients who get back a pulse before arrival in hospital uh, since the launch of the strategy. All of us would welcome um, the changes that improve the outcomes for patients, but looking at the um, measurements on the, the, the heat targets, you know, we see 
uh, reach 80% of cardiac patients within eight minutes, um, 9% below target. Your category A instance, 10% below target. Category B, 14%. Um, stroke, 10%. And we do see, you know, other areas where there has been significant improvement above target. Um, I didn't hear you commenting on those areas. So, uh, I'll hand back to Pauline in a sec, but just, just to comment that um, whilst time targets are important, they're very important, we need to get to patients in a timely way uh, with the right resource that the patient needs. <coughs> Clinical outcomes are perhaps more important. Uh, and you know, my submission from a medical perspective would be that actually we need to get patients what they need. As Pauline said, this is um, the kind of experience they want from the ambulance service. They want things that are important to them. Um, but they also want good clinical outcomes. We want life saved. We want uh, stroke disability reduced. Uh, we want sepsis treated early. Um, and that doesn't always mean sending uh, the fastest resource. Sometimes it means sending the best resource. Um, so an example is this, uh, a clinical example, uh, would be stroke. Um, it's very easy sometimes to send the nearest resource to a stroke, a person who's had an acute stroke, um, if that resource is a car. But of course, almost certainly, this patient will need transport to hospital. So it's often better to send a slightly marginally slower response where that response is then able to convey the patient to hospital where they need to be rather than send an earlier response, a car, to stop the clock to improve the kind of time uh, targets that you're talking about, but perhaps not improve the patient's clinical journey. So uh, a lot of the thinking around the new clinical response model is not just about time. Time is important, but it's about getting the best resource, the right resource to the patient, so that we can improve the longer term outcomes. Any time element within that? Yeah, the, t the time targets are important. Are these, do they remain in the new model? They do. And, and what about in relation to the overall review of targets that's going on with Harry Burns and others? Are you, are you involved in that? And will that change things again? Yes, yeah, so as, as part of the introduction of the new response model in November last year, and it's been introduced in phases, the second phase uh, is introduced next next month, we've developed uh, more evidence-based performance standards, <coughs> and we want to continue to refine them as we as we go. So we've shared with Sir Harry Burns um, the work that we've done in the modelling we've done in the evidence base, and as part of our new response model, that will be independently evaluated um, by the University of Stirling, and that's what the Chief Medical Officer asked us to do too. Okay, Alex. Good morning uh, to the panel. Thank you for coming to see us today. Um, I'm very proud to have in my constituency um, two centres of the Scottish Ambulance Service, both the Risk and Resilience Unit and the uh, Call Handling Centre. Um, just specifically, I wanted to pick up on something uh, that came up in respect of cardiac arrest. Um, before, I've got a couple of other questions as well, but, but specifically on your point on cardiac arrest and the disparity of survival rates in Scotland versus those in Scandinavia. As I understand it, in Norway in particular, the reason that cardiac arrest survival is so much better is because they have an educated population who know what to do in uh, in the event of a cardiac arrest in the general public, that they have actual training in schools, and that's mandatory, and, um, and, and even doesn't need to be onerous, but it happens. Um, I'm aware that the British Heart Foundation have a call and a campaign to see um, an hour's worth of training in first aid given to all secondary pupils at some time in their school career. That's something I put a motion before Parliament in support of. Just wondered if you had a view as an organisation in support of that kind of shift to training in schools so that people are equipped with the knowledge and skills to, to deliver that first aid? Yeah, that's a really helpful comment. Um, I, bystander CPR, so CPR performed by somebody who witnesses cardiac arrest is absolutely crucially important. Survival from cardiac arrest doesn't just depend on the ambulance service, but there's a whole chain of events that need to stack up. And the first uh, is call for help and then bystander CPR. Um, anything that increases the proportion of bystander CPR that occurs after cardiac arrest will improve outcomes. Um, we know that in Scotland, bystander CPR happens only about half the time, less than half the time, in fact. Whereas in the best centres, and it's not only places like Scandinavia, but uh, the west coast of the United States, uh, many, there are many other places uh, that have really good outcomes. Bystander CPR happens up to 85% of the time. So that's what we're going in for. We need to seriously overhaul the way we view cardiac arrest as a community. In places like Denmark, this has been done by making uh, CPR training in schools mandatory. But that's not the only way to uh, improve things. 
Um, it's certainly something that we have um, looked at and discussed with the Scottish Government, but at the moment we're taking a different approach, which is to support a national organisation called Save a Life for Scotland, and that's a collaboration between all of the emergency services, uh, third sector organisations like British Heart Foundation, Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland, uh, British Red Cross, uh, St Andrew's Ambulance, a whole range of organisations, um, to do CPR training in communities and with communities, and that includes in a range of schools. So one of the um, targets for Save Life for Scotland, of which we're a member, is to try and get all schools in Scotland, or give all schools in Scotland, the opportunity to learn CPR over the next five years. Thank you for that. May I continue with the other questions? Yeah. Community? Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, I've got the Risk and Resilience uh, Unit in my constituency. I've visited it a couple of times. I'm very proud to have it there and some uh, absolute heroes who work there. Um, given the events in Manchester, um, are are we as a country prepared for a similar attack in Scotland in terms of the response of the emergency services, particularly as was necessary in Manchester last night, the emergency response of the ambulance services? Well, we work very closely with other, other emergency services and indeed with the ambulance services across the, the UK. So we always take on board any learning that we can from the tragedies, uh, such as the one experienced in Manchester last night. And of course, we're already in touch with North West Ambulance Service this morning to take any, any immediate learning that we, that we can. We have a whole programme of planning, preparation, testing and training of our, of our staff, not just our colleagues within our risk and resilience department, but across the, the whole service and emergency preparedness. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Tom. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Convener, and welcome to the panel. Um, I just want to pick up on something that uh, Pauline Howey stated, uh, said in her opening statement. Um, you referenced uh, the additional of, uh, of addition of new roles and skills. I wonder if you could outline to the committee what that will consist of. Yes, yeah, so the, d the development is across our whole workforce um, because we know that um, enhancing the clinical skills of our staff can not only save more lives but can improve outcomes for, for patients. So we've talked a little bit about cardiac arrest but the most common reason why people phone 99 is for an elderly person that's fallen and we know that a lot of elderly people that have fallen are not injured and they don't want to go to hospital. Um, so we've been developing different skills mm. for staff to be able to assess and refer people to alternative pathways that are community based so for example we've been developing new roles called specialist paramedics that have got enhanced um, skills and they can treat and refer and work as part of a community or primary based uh, team within communities paul you might want to say a bit more about them yes yeah, certainly so we've got a number of specialist paramedics that are already trained um, with a commitment of 240 by 2020 and one of the key areas where they can actually utilize their skills is through the integration agenda and integration with primary care um, and the convener would be pleased to know that there's a, a trial going on currently in um, deans and early bone medical practice where there is a specialist paramedic based in the practice for seven and a half hours a day um, doing the mobile workforce, going visiting patients, working as part of that integrated health system um, to try and stem demand from coming to us and treat patients more appropriately at the right time in the right place. Um, they do a lot more on minor illness and minor injuries which aren't part of the core paramedic curriculum and haven't been for a number of years but as we transform um, in relation to education and pathways that will become more mainstream in relation to the demand increases that we've seen. That's interesting. I want to ask to what extent the realistic medicine agenda is informing your approach, because there seem to be some echoes of that in talking about taking care to the patient, and also reflected in the, uh, the latest statistics from um, uh, April, where in the uh, reducing hospital attendances, you're actually exceeding your target quite significantly. Um, is the realistic medicine agenda informing your practice and approach? Absolutely, and it, wor it works in um, both ways as, as well. So we've been sharing our approach mm. um, with the, the Chief Medical Officer and, and, and her team as, uh, as well. Uh, we know these models work. Um, we um, had an, uh, our own evaluation of the, of the model uh, based on the small tests that we did um, a few years ago. And recently, the Nuffield Trust have reported in March um, 2017 uh, that the model of community-based paramedics helps in terms of keeping people at home and shifting the, the balance of care. Yeah. The final question I want to ask is, um, ISD states that as of um, December last year, uh, 1,385 AHPs, essentially paramedics, and understands a Scottish Government commitment by the end of this Parliament to increase that number by 1,000. Um, I wonder if we can discuss what impact you think that will have, and will that also help to address some of the areas where you're falling short of your targets? 
it's, it's fantastic news to be able to train that, that number of, of new paramedics um, in, the, in the service and working in our, our communities as, as well. Um, so we are very much an, an, an unscheduled care mm -hmm. service, part of the, the health service, and we're community and, and primary care um, based. And um, I think that we can offer a huge amount uh, to patients in, in communities going forward with that mm -hmm. investment of a thousand more trained paramedics. Thank you. So you mentioned the deans and Aileburn practice. Is that the practice that effectively went bust recently? Um, that sort of terminology, they're, they're certainly struggling and we're certainly helping out where we can. It, so, um, we, 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 was, were you folks brought in to assist in that because of the fallout from that, or is were, were you in there prior to that happening? Um, it, it, it happened about the same time, um, but it's part of our longer term strategy because we've also got similar models in Kels or Hoik. Um, and certainly in the north of the country where we've got integration there um, to trying to bring together all the different aspects of primary care and for us to integrate in their work streams to use the available resources to best effect for the patient's need at home. Okay. Uh, Alison. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, and, you know, I, I too have had the privilege of visiting my local ambulance um, centre and it was certainly heartening to, to see the uh, you know the skilled workforce in action, and to listen into, you, you know, to some of the calls. So I understand um, the training that has gone into making sure that calls are handled as appropriately as possible. But um, Pauline, how you highlighted the the number of calls that are related to old people and falls. So do you liaise with government departments that might assist in preventing falls in the first place? Do you have any input there? So we've been working with the assisted living uh, programme at Scottish uh, Government to try to prevent um, falls uh, because we know if people do um, become dependent on health services then, then they very quickly uh, lose the, the, their independence um, and the return to independent living for them um, can, be, can be an uphill um, struggle. So we've been able to identify through some of the work we've been doing for example, in identifying alternative models of, of, of care for people who have fallen, eh, those that are more at risk now of falling and put in place preventative measures such as um, housing adaptations um, or it might be um, changes in terms of uh, medicines management for, for those um, patients. So we're working very much as part of a, a multi-agency team uh, now to, to share our learning and to try to put in place much more sustainable services that not just respond but can anticipate and ultimately prevent. Okay. So are you seeing any improvement because of the work that's happening already? So um, the data that we collect is in terms of uh, those people who um, have um, fallen at home that aren't injured and whether we're able to keep those people into, into community settings and we're seeing a significant um, improvement in terms of our um, contribution. I think it's too early to say yet in terms of that kind of a wider prevention agenda. Okay. Um, you spoke about um, the Public Health Minister's commitment to a thousand new paramedics by 2020. Is that going to be possible? I mean, we have, uh, you know, we've taken a great deal of evidence with regards to recruitment and retention across medical professions. Just who is it that you hope to attract to those roles? So we um, train a lot of people ourselves, so people can uh, join the ambulance service and be trained as an ambulance technician. Uh, and that takes about 18 months um, and then there's a period of consolidation of the practice and then they can go on and train to become paramedics. We're also um, introducing a, a degree course at Glasgow Caledonian University in September uh, this year as a, as a trial um, too. Um, and we've seen that across the country, um, the Scottish Ambulance Service remains an attractive employer. Last year, as part of the first phase of investing in new staff and new roles in the, in the service, we attracted over four, uh, sorry, 5,000 applications uh, for, for roles within our, our service. Um, there are some pockets in remote and rural um, areas where it is harder uh, to attract staff. And so we developed a new model last year, which uh, was specifically looking at people that already worked and lived in those communities uh, to try to encourage them to consider a career with our service because we know that they're more likely to stay in those communities uh, once they're trained as, uh, with us. Can I ask a further question, Convener? Um, this is specifically around the area of neonatal transport. Um, You'll be aware that the Maternity and Neonatal Services Review recommended reducing the number of units from 15 to 5 and potentially 3, which will of course mean that more travel is required. How involved are you in those sorts of decisions and, and also there'll be implications in staff training there too? 
So we, we were a member of the Maternity and Neonatal Programme uh, Board uh, that, that reviewed the existing arrangements um, and we will continue to work with the, the areas as we move towards the, the new model that that review set out. Uh, we're at the very early stages, uh, but we do um, have the Scott Star um, Special Strategic Phone Transport Service that includes the neonatal um, service and it carries out a fantastic service every year. Okay, thank you. Thank you, convener. Uh, Ivan. And thanks, panel, for coming along this morning. Um, I wanted to just drill down a wee bit in terms of some of the some of the measures you've got um, and understand how that fits together. Um, and I suppose just taking a step back, I'm looking at the data. It's here, and if I'm reading this right, you're doing about six hundred thousand plus incidents a year and about nearly nine hundred thousand journeys. And you mentioned that there's three thousand of those are, are cardiac, um, and I know there'll be other serious issues in there, but uh, I would reckon that I guess you can confirm that the vast majority will be less less serious, perhaps. Um, and when you look at those numbers, the thing that comes to my mind is um, how effective your call screening processes are at the start to understand what's actually in front of you and what the best resource to deploy is, because clearly you, want to you don't want to de deploy a resource to something where it could be better used somewhere else. Um, so I suppose I'd be interested to know, do you measure how effectiveness that call screening is? Because I thought, to my mind, that would be probably the most important metric, because if you get that right, everything else kind of flows from that. Um, and then secondly, following up on what Alison Johnson talked about, around about preventative measures, I mean, falls is a good example. But again, if you're working hand in glove with other parts of the health service that are engaged in the preventative agenda, what you should see, obviously, is the total number of incidents going down as well. Um, and I wonder if, if you were tracking that and seeing any impact there as well. Yeah, so um, as part of the investment in our staff, we're significantly invested in our three ambulance control centres that work virtually as, as, as one ambulance control centre. And we've established uh, clinical hubs within those centres. Uh, and those are staffed by uh, nurses and paramedics and doctors who can help staff in terms of uh, refine the triage and make sure that we direct the ambulances to the most appropriate calls. And where an ambulance isn't required, uh, then try to refer that to another part of the health and social care system. And the modelling that we did uh, in 2015 suggested that ultimately about 30% of the demand that we were seeing at that time could potentially be better served by uh, being served by another part of the health and social care delivery uh, network. So that's ultimately what we're aiming for over the five-year reform um, programme, and we've got milestones along that, that journey as we, as we go. Uh, Paul looks after our ambulance control centres to so be able to explain in more detail. Certainly, and the call screening programme that, that we use, or the process and protocols, is uh, internationally recognised. It's got standards council and is constantly being updated. Um, our staff are currently undertaking training um, to move to the next version, version 13, um, which is geared towards identifying um, life-threatening patients much quicker. And it's also changing the process in relation to, as Gareth alluded to earlier, improving cardiac arrest survival and recognition by getting hands on chest much quicker. Um, our call handlers are audited and uh, we have to do up to 3% of audits on all the calls that come in. And we feed that back to the, um, the body with which we have the license. Um, and we are working towards what we call a centre of excellence accreditation, which means that we are robust in relation to our triage processes um, and there's 20 standards that we have to meet and give evidence in relation to that to the licensing authority um, before we will be able to do that. And we hope to achieve that by March next year. Right, but I suppose the question was, do you have a measure on that? Because I would have thought if you take, I don't know, whatever is a million calls, you would know um, at the point where the person takes the call, they make a decision, is this A, B or C? And then when you go through that process and the ambulance arrives and they either decide this was a, you called this a B, but it should have been an A or vice versa, do you have those numbers? Is there that feedback loop? And can you tell me what that percentage okay, so, call is, okay. if you like? Yeah, so obviously, um, so obviously the, the codes that come out um, are generated by the system and they're in direct response to questions that are scripted and answered by the patient. So a lot of it is reliant upon the interpretation of the person who's with the patient. Um, and occasionally, you know, that, that is wrong. Um, in most cases, I'm pleased to say it's not.
um, but what we do have is our crews when they arrive at scene and as part of the electronic uh, patient report form they have a, a box which they complete which confirms that it was in the right category and the right protocol in relation to that um, and we've got a high percentage I haven't got an exact percentage but we've got a high percentage yeah. that are accurate in relation to that Variation between the cords um, can happen as the patient may in improve or deteriorate whilst we're en route. Um, yeah. But for patients that are considered to be at risk, we stay on the phone with them and we monitor that throughout and try to update the crews whilst they're en route. Yeah. I mean, again, coming back to, I would have thought, and you maybe want to get back on the number, but I would have thought that measure would have been absolutely critical to the health of the whole system and you should be tracking that week in, week out, to see where your trend's going. Because if you get that right, everything else kind of falls from that, I would, I would have thought. And the, the second question around about the preventative agenda, are you seeing yet any impact in the number of calls coming down as a consequence of any preventative work that you're doing? So our call volumes continue to increase, but the proportion that we are seeing is for a hearing and treating and referring is increasing, so we're sending... Um, of that total proportion, we're sending more to other parts of the health and social care system. And um, as the most recent figures show, the proportion then that we take care to patients in their own homes is also increasing. So that's the two areas that we see that we can shift the balance of care and keep people into community settings and out of hospital where they don't require to be. Yeah, so ultimately, you. we think about 40% of our activity um, requires to get to hospital, mm -hmm. some not immediately. Um, some patients uh, might, uh, for example, be preferential to wait to the next day till the clinic is open. Um, and that's what we're doing in terms of that uh, differentiation and refining the triage arrangements. Gareth might want to say a little bit more about the evidence base for, for that. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. A couple of things. First, just in terms of uh, prevention affecting the number of calls, I guess there are lots of drivers that uh, uh, affect the number of calls the ambulance service get every year. And it's not like there's a static body of people who are going to call in any given 12-month period. And by preventing some of those calls, we then reduce the numbers because the general trend is for an ever-increasing number of emergency calls. And that reflects, I think, the change in the way that or the, the number of options that patients perceive or potential patients perceive that they have uh, pre-hospital when something goes wrong. Um, so the tendency is for our numbers to increase. It's partly demographics, but it's partly a shift in the pattern of care or options of care that people have uh, in the community. Um, so, you know, while we do our best to reduce that by uh, preventative measures, I'm not sure that we would expect to see that directly um, uh, threading through into numbers of calls. So is there an issue there people not understanding what they should do and, and, and calling an ambulance when, in many cases, they shouldn't? Is that part of the issue? I think, or? I think that's part of the issue, but it's complex. Yeah. So it's a change in the way that... Uh, out of hours, other out of hours services are run. Uh, partly, it's to do with people's changing perceptions of healthcare and their ability to manage their own health expectations of the mm -hmm. health service. Um, uh, I work in the emergency department here in Edinburgh, and we see the same pattern. Mm -hmm. um, the kinds of cases that are coming um, is shifting. Actually, we're getting older people, but we're also getting lots of younger people too. So we've seen a spike in the 16 to 35 age group as well as the older age group. And that's not because they're getting sicker, it's because they're coming in with things that previously they would have gone to other places with. Right, and apart from it being not being an appropriate place to go, it's also not an effective use of resources across the, yeah, the whole health it's, service. It's, uh, it's a problem. Right, okay. The other thing I wanted to mention, um, just in terms of drilling down onto the accuracy of diagnosis using the, the protocols and ambulance control, um, I just wanted to, to give an example of what we're doing around, again, cardiac arrest um, to help illustrate the fact that we're very proactive in this and take it very seriously. You've correctly identified that actually that triage point at ambulance control is the, is the pivot for the whole system. If that doesn't work, then all sorts of other things don't work as well as they could do. Um, so we've spent, as a service, a lot of time even listening to individual uh, cardiac arrest calls to say what are the barriers that get in the way what are the linguistic barriers what are the misunderstandings that get in the way between the call coming in and the response being sent or somebody being persuaded to do bystander CPR and we have some published work on that we've done in collaboration with um, the University of Edinburgh um, in addition of course the other big uh, triage challenge is around major trauma 
again, if there's a big smash, if there's a big accident, um, correctly discerning what resource needs to be sent and in what kind of time scale is really important, not only for saving lives, but also for saving money. Um, so we are right at the centre of the process that's examining how we best triage trauma across the whole country as part of the trauma reconfiguration exercise. So we take this area of ambulance control and triage very seriously. Okay, clear. Thank you, convener, and uh, thank you, panel, uh, for coming along this morning. Um, from what I've been reading and what I'm hearing, this is quite a significant change. This new model is, is, is very different to how the ambulance service was working before. And you're asking ambulance service staff to, to do the job differently in terms of the activity, in terms of judgment, and particularly in terms of risk assessment as well. So what training have you put in place as an organisation for your current staffing? So we have um, ongoing annual uh, training for our, for our staff, and that's refreshed each year based on their feedback. Uh, so, for example, last year, based on staff feedback, we said they wanted more around obstetrics and paediatrics. So we put that into the, the annual uh, programme of training for them. As part of the introduction of the new response model, we've been engaging with staff around uh, what else they would like to see in terms of their training and development. Um, and we also, as I said, in terms of the 1,000 new paramedics are enhancing the skills of of the new staff coming into the service, or indeed those staff that were previously ambulance technicians that are now being trained as, as ambulance paramedics. So it's very holistic, the training uh, programme, it's for all staff. And the new model, as you rightly say, is a significant difference from what we previously operated and requires all staff to work, work differently. So we've significantly invested in our practice placement educators that work within our ambulance divisions and ambulance locations, as well as the people that work for us at Glasgow College Caledonian University in terms of training new staff or upskilling existing staff. So you mentioned there are some very specific areas of, of healthcare, Obzingen, for example. But uh, how does that then? How do those skills that people are learning, which is fair enough, they, they get that through you uh, providing training through the feedback they've been giving you. But how does that feed into the new model, which sounds like it's a very different way of working? And as you've not got a, a huge staffing turnover, you've got a lot of staff who've been with you for quite some period of time. Yeah. How are you supporting them in so, that? So the, the, the most significant change in, in practice is within the ambulance control rooms. Um, and Paul might want to say a little bit more about the intensive support that we've been given for staff within, within them. Yes, yeah, certainly. And, and when we're looking at clinical advisors, there's quite um, an in-depth process that's ongoing around the triage system that we use and um, how we safely discharge patients or transfer them to other pathways of care. Um, and also in the field, um, there's... Um, documentation and there is a patient safety manager who's been looking at safe referral and discharge and what we need to do um, to ensure that patients do meet those requirements and again when we've been down in um, it's certainly in the Scottish borders um, in Kelso and Hoyk we've been um, trialing those um, models um, in Hoyk we had specialist paramedics again embedded with GP practices and we used all the paramedics at Hoyk station to do that test of change um, and that's been very successful, and they've safely left at home um, a significant number of patients, um, all referred them back into the GP community locally for appropriate care and support, um, and also into avenues in social care um, and bringing other people on board. So it's about now um, rolling that out um, across the country, and as Pauline's explained, um, we have the um, learning and practice programmes, which we run every year, um, committing this year to two days um, and these will all be part of the agenda items um, as well as any educational sessions via e-learning or any other portals that people want to undertake. Um, so that's a continuous process that we, we do um, and it's also learning from um, good experiences and bad experiences in relation to complaints, concerns and as well as compliments to, um, to try and hone what is best practice. So these new roles that have been developed within the, the ambulance service, I'm hearing you talk about practice education facilitators and uh, what's it, uh, patient safety facilitators. So the, 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 the patient safety manager um, sits within our clinical directorate centrally um, and does the um, horizon scanning to make sure across the Scottish Ambulance Service. I don't understand what that term means. Can you please explain what horizon scanning is? Right, OK. So what they do is they look at the national picture um, and they look at everything that's going on, um, looking for best practice. And we, we undertake the improvement methodology through um, doing tests to change. And that's a central repository 
to to look at that, to look at what works um, and what we need to um, revise and improve on. Um, the other thing is with the delivering future leaders and managers, we've got team leaders and local managers who through the staff engagement processes are also doing um, local roadshows and local training, which they're well capable of doing. Um, and in Edinburgh just recently, um, we had a good example where a local team identified an issue um, and they got the um, training trailer to come in and spent time with all their staff um, going through that at a local level. So we encourage all these um, the different models of training and certainly well aware of that um, ongoing on some of the islands as well where the team leaders take that responsibility, feed into the um, syllabus that's delivered centrally and make sure that as far as possible it's, um, it's divested locally to staff. And that sort of leads me on to my, to my next question about the this, uh, initial training that paramedics and ambulance technicians receive. Um, you were saying that there's a course being developed at Caledonia University. So how are you inputting into that to make sure that the paramedics that are being trained now are going to be trained in the new model of working? So it's, it's our trainers and educators that are based at Glasgow Caledonian University. They, they design the course and it's, it's accredited. Um, too, um, and uh, they draw in other healthcare professionals that are based in Glasgow Caledonian as in, uh, as it's necessary. Uh, we've also seen that there's benefits in terms of that collaboration uh, with other healthcare professionals too by being based at GCU, um, and uh, that's that's uh, been helpful in terms of being able to learn from other professions as we develop paramedics within the Scottish Ambulance Service. And can I ask one final question, Convener? Thank you. Um, have you had any feedback from public, from patients, from service users or service providers about the new model, about the new model rollout, how well it's working, where the where the issues are, where the where the difficulties are with it? We've been engaging with patient groups across the, the, the country, uh, first of all, to reassure them um, based on the clinical evidence um, and to get their feedback as to what they would like to see going going, going forward. And, and the issues for patients are uh, that we will be able to quickly identify those immediately life-threatening um, cases um, and get the best ambulance response um, for them and what it means in terms of being able to um, safely safety net those patients uh, that don't perhaps need that immediacy of response, but it's appropriate to get the conveying resource um, there, in, there in time. Um, so we work with uh, patient and public forums across the whole country. Uh, they help us in terms of the design of our services. For example, they've helped us uh, design uh, new needs assessment models in the patient transport service, new vehicle designs, etc. And that's an ongoing engagement programme. So our service is very much based on patient experience and, and staff experience. Thank you. Could I ask that if you could provide us with um, performance information based on the new system because I think the committee clerks wrote, wrote to you, uh, yourselves and what we got was updated um, uh, time information rather than information based on the new model. So if you could provide that for us, that would be uh, very welcome. Uh, Marie. Um, I represent the Highlands and Islands, so I'm particularly interested to hear about um, provision uh, of ambulance services in remote and rural areas. I visited the ambulance centre in Isla, and I was very impressed uh, by the team there. Um, I just wondered if you had, um, if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about the different type of service that's available in remote and rural areas. Well, do you, you'll be aware that, for example, the, the model in, in, in Isla um, it very much is a, is a, is a partnership-type model. We work very closely with the, the hospital and the GPs uh, based in Ireland, as well as the, the other um, responders there, too. Um, we have a range of uh, different types of responders. So we've got over a thousand community first responder schemes in Sc community first responders in Scotland that operate out of about 130 um, schemes, um, and they provide a really valuable service whilst the ambulance is is, is on its um, way. We've recently introduced in Grampian, for example, um, a, a new model called Wildcat, uh, where people are uh, members of the community or nurses or doctors are trained uh, to offer an immediate response to cardiac arrest as well. So we very much work with communities to design models that suit their local circumstances and as you'll well be aware every rural community and every island community is very different in terms of the resources and the assets that are that are there in those communities. Thanks. I wonder if you could um, 
tell me a little bit more about, as well, about hospital transfer. So, um, for example, not necessarily the urgent transfers like the cardiac arrest, but, but perhaps the less urgent transfers from an island, for example. So I've heard anecdotally from people who have talked about the difficulties of the number of ambulances that can go on a ferry or transferring people from an ambulance on a ferry into an ambulance on the other side because they don't want the, the island ambulance to be away for a long time. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit more about the logistics of, of those particular challenges. Well, it's, it's challenging in terms of all the, the, the different ferry arrangements across across the country. We obviously have the Scottish Air Ambulance Service uh, for those um, cases that need uh, to be uh, removed by, 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 by air transport. Some of those patients will be emergencies. Others um, will be uh, more planned um, journeys or, or urgent journeys um, too. And we work very closely with the um, community-based hospitals, the GPs and the ferry companies to try to make sure that we can retrieve patients um, as smoothly as we possibly can based on their presenting need at that particular point in, in, in time. Often in the island communities we do try to keep the island ambulance on the island and we will send a mainland based ambulance over to, to, to retrieve the patient and bring them into the, the specialised care in the, in the mainland. Miles? Uh, thank you for being here and good morning to the panel. Um, the weekend before last the Scottish Ambulance Service along with, I think, all other health boards apart from NHS Lothian, um, experienced a cyber attack with ransomware. And I wondered if you could update the committee on what changes you've put in place since then and any additional um, capacity needs you've identified which will have to be brought forward around IT. I will do. Um, I'm before I hand over to my, my colleague, uh, Gerry O'Brien, uh, I'd just like to comment that there was no operational impact in terms of service delivery um, from the, the malware attack a couple of weeks ago. Okay, thank you, Pauline. Yes, uh, the the service was made aware of the this malware attack, ransomware attack at uh, fifteen forty-five hours uh, on, on that Friday afternoon, uh, and by half past four uh, that afternoon, we had identified there was fifteen PCs, uh, fourteen PCs in a laptop that had actually been infected uh, by that r ransomware attack. Uh, the majority of those PCs uh, were actually located within our Aberdeen network, so we took immediate steps to isolate our Aberdeen network from the, the, rest, the rest of the, the national network uh, as purely as a precautionary uh, item. Uh, and by half past five, we had actually updated our monitoring software and our SOFOS software to actually uh, effectively uh, fight against any future uh, ransomware attack. As Pauline has said, I'm actually I'm very pleased to, to go. There was no patient data impacted at all uh, in the ransomware attack. The, the 15 PCs which we have we identified, which have now all actually uh, been replaced, we're all providing admin uh, and back office uh, functions. Uh, we were a little bit puzzled uh, as to why we actually had 15 PCs uh, that w were affected out of our, uh, over 1,500 uh, estate of, of, of PCs, uh, and, we, and we've identified that down to a, a patching issue. We take a very robust uh, approach to bat, uh, patching of PCs, and we, we always insist that we've got the most up-to-date uh, versions of software, and we do the same with our major business-critical uh, systems. Uh, we work very closely with Paul's team in, in relation to bringing systems down and moving back to analog and paper to ensure that we've got the most up-to-date software in there. So we're just, the remedial action for us, we're just reviewing our patching arrangements just to make sure that we are up-to-date. We have everything set to automatically update every two hours and we're just, we're just working through why these 15 were not, were not picked up through that, but it's just led us to, to reinforce that. But please, please do report to committee that there was uh, no uh, impact at all on, on patient data. Um, thank you for the update. Um, my second question relates to um, pressures on maternity units because um, within NHS Lothian, certainly, I've had a number of cases um, where expectant mothers have presented at a maternity unit and been sent home um, to then go into birth and have to call out um, for an emergency ambulance to attend. Um, are you seeing these sorts of incidents increasing? Because certainly it's becoming... Um, Sadly, quite a regular incident I'm being told of happening with NHS Lothian. And we've met as a committee with um, a number of maternity nurses under sort of Chatham House um, surroundings, and they've highlighted this specific problem as well. We haven't seen any particular spikes in terms of our uh, patient-related data around maternity cases, as you, as you describe. Um, I don't know if colleagues have got any further intelligence around that. 
No. No. Sorry. no. Sorry, and we, and we know only a proportion of um, expectant mothers um, do travel with the ambulance service to hospital, so we wouldn't see the true effect of those sorts of situations. The ones that we are more, more likely to be called to are imminent births, um, complications, or where there is no transport available in certain areas. Um, and as Pauline said, certainly from looking at the data, there's no indication that we've seen a significant increase in those sorts of areas in, in any part of the country. Thank you. In, in relation to the malware attack, there was no no missed appointments or any delayed appointments or anything like that? No. No? Okay, thanks. Uh, Jenny. Um, Pauline, how you, um, you commented that uh, the ambulance service remains an attractive employer, but if we look at the 2015 NHS staff survey, a couple of um, worrying things come out. So, for example, uh, in terms of the statement, uh, your staff were kept informed about uh, what is happening in the board. Only 39% uh, agreed with that. And my line manager communicates effectively with me. Only 42% agreed with that. That's the lowest um, for all, I think, national bodies in the NHS. Can you account for why that might be the case? We're a very unique service compared to other bodies within within the NHS. A distributed workforce that's mobile and works in in communities mm -hmm. uh, twenty four seven. Um, so further to the to the staff survey, uh, we have been implementing the iMatter staff experience tool, um, and I'm pleased to say that that's now fully rolled out across the the ambulance service and our employee engagement scores, uh, which is a, as a measure of how engaged people are within <coughs> within their workplace, is is sixty seven percent, which is much better than we were expecting and the participation uh, rates are, are, are 70 percent so much higher participation in I matter than we had in the, the previous staff survey but we're never complacent uh, we have a range of channels uh, where we engage with staff um, and that communication is, is two ways uh, for example a couple of weeks ago I uh, undertook a quarterly webcast uh, where anyone in the service can ask any questions at all of me or the the, the senior uh, manager team I have a, a weekly a bulletin which is um, three hot topics um, of the week um, and always uh, we highlight the fantastic examples of good practice mm -hmm. uh, that goes on in the service so that we can share that learning as uh, as well we have um, station meetings across the, the service uh, we have social media and a range of different opportunities uh, for for staff to engage and we've been enhancing and developing our frontline leaders and managers uh, through our developing our future leaders program um, and we're giving um, them more dedicated time so that they can help to develop their teams um, in the areas that are important uh, to them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Computer. If I could just pick out yeah. another couple of points from the staff survey. Um, only 20% of your staff agreed with the statement that when changes uh, are made at work, I'm clear about how they will work in practice. And only 53% had had a knowledge and skills framework development review in the past 12 months. So <laughs> nearly more, nearly half rather of your staff haven't had a, a staff review in the past year. And I appreciate that you've put in place changes uh, on the back of that staff review but that again doesn't match up to other NHS uh, boards nationally so I just wonder why again that might be the case and did you involve staff in the move to the new clinical response model were they part of that process because it seems like there's a disconnect uh, between how staff are feeling on the ground uh, and what's happening at a kind of corporate level in terms of the board. Well, I think some of the key differences are because we are a mobile workforce, so yeah. it, it, we need to use different channels um, for, for engaging um, staff. Uh, but and certainly in terms of the new response model, it was very much based on staff feedback. Mm -hmm. Staff were concerned um, that they were uh, blue lighting um, themselves. Um, to incidents that potentially didn't require that level of, of, of response um, and we're frequently we've been stood down once we get more intelligence from the caller um, about the nature of the, the presenting condition of, of, of patients so this has been co-designed with our staff and we continue to adapt the model based on staff feedback okay thank you so just to follow up on that i kind of get the impression that there's a bit of no one to face up to difficult things here because if we look at that section on staff satisfaction and absence you know only 13 percent saying they feel consulted only 34 percent would recommend uh, as the workplace is a good place to work um 39 percent saying they're kept informed 15 15 percent saying they're not enough staff to do the job and 29 percent saying they can meet all conflicting demands if you look at that compared to say um the staff survey in wales it is significantly different significantly different and we've already um, looked at the performance data where I don't think you really mentioned too much about the issues where there was 
a falling, failing in performance. Um, and there's been no mention of sickness absence or anything like that. So I just wonder, there seems to be a disconnect between what your staff are saying on the ground and what you're giving us an impression of, that everything in the service is really going along swimmingly. As I said, we're partway through a significant reform of our, of our services and there's much more that we want to, to do. We want to continue to develop staff. We want to continue to put in place opportunities um, for them to be further engaged in the, the development of our service and listen to their ideas and take on board their ideas. Um, and that's why we've invested in those frontline leaders and, and managers. We're a very distributed service. We can't do all from the from the centre. Uh, we really want to empower local staff to develop services with and, and for local communities um, as they see within a, a governance framework that is safe and effective uh, based on the, on the work that our clinical governance um, team, team do. So we're absolutely not com complacent. Uh, we've been uh, looking at our health and wellbeing strategy for our, for our staff. Um, you, you will be aware that our staff um, put themselves uh, into very uh, challenging um, circumstances um, and see sometimes the most horrific of, of, of scenes. Um, and so we have support mechanisms in place uh, for, our, for our staff. Uh, we've recently conducted a stress audit um, and we've got individual stress assessment tools now uh, that we're training our staff in as, uh, as well. So there's a whole range of um, opportunities for further uh, support mechanisms for, for staff and that's part of our health and wellbeing strategy that our staff partners have been designing with us. Colin. And, and good morning to the panel. C can I go back to the, the issue that was mentioned earlier about the proposal to recruit an additional um, 1,000 new paramedics over the next five years, which is obviously a very substantial increase in, in the current workforce. Uh, and given the points that were raised earlier about the, um, first of all, the staff survey, which showed 15% of staff believed they didn't have enough people to do the job, which is half the level of the rest of the NHS. Uh, and given the high level of staff absences that the conveners just mentioned here, at, at what point was it noticed that the service was, was so understaffed? Well, as we uh, developed the new model and the proposals for the new model in 2015, we underpinned that with a, a, a five-year workforce plan and a five-year financial plan. Um, and it was based on that new model um, and uh, the benefits that we could demonstrate for, for patients uh, that we um, have secured the Scottish Government's commitment to invest in the service over the coming five years. Jenny, do you want to say a bit more about that investment? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the we we worked very hard uh, over the last couple of years with Scottish Government colleagues in terms of developing that uh, financial plan, uh, which is in, in, entirely driven by our, our, our workforce uh, model and, and and the significant, in, as I think as members of the committee have noticed, the significant uh, increases in staffing levels uh, that will be coming into the service. But not only that, uh, it's the significant increase in staffing levels uh, in the control room, but the investment which. Uh, my colleagues have spoken about this morning in, in additional training, but also the what we've also tried to address over the last couple of budget setting rounds that we've got there now is making sure that uh, our frontline resources are adequately resourced in terms of what we call relief cover. So that's actually making sure that the staff are covered for when the annual leave, sick leave, etc., etc. So uh, I think it is part of that overall workforce plan in terms of saying this this is where we are today this is where we would want to move to uh, based on uh, uh, appropriate utilization levels allowing for appropriate time off the road for training cpd etc etc and and then building towards that and that that's what leads into this overall investment uh, portfolio that's required over a whole a whole range of uh, headings over the we've already recruited over uh, as Pauline, I think, indicated, re recruited a significant number last year, this year, uh, and moving towards the balance by 2020, when we will have implemented the full strategy. So I think we've got all the elements now pulling together, but as Pauline says, it all, it all, it all commends with the design of the new clinical response model back in 2014, moving into 2015. But it's a substantial change to the current levels of staffing. So how can we be reassured that the workforce planning is going to work because it clearly didn't work up until now because you're, you're significantly understaffed uh, with high levels of stress, high levels of absence rates uh, and, and, and a plan to substantially increase the number of staff. So clearly the workforce planning didn't work up until now. So how can we be assured that what you're putting in place is going to work in the future in terms of workforce planning because the NHS doesn't seem to be particularly good at planning workforce levels? 
So we um, undertook a, a resource modelling exercise um, to understand um, all the variables that, variables that impact in terms of the staffing requirements, not just in terms of numbers, but skills mix based on the new clinical model. And we continue to refine that um, as we uh, progress towards 2020. Um, we have been successful in uh, recruiting uh, the staff that we've needed up to now, um, but they're not all doing the things that we need them to do yet because there's a period of induction and training and development of, of those staff. So as we move through to 2020, we will start to see more of the benefits um, coming through in terms of the, the performance measures that we mentioned, i.e. more lives being saved from cardiac arrest, more patients being safely and appropriately cared for in their community settings and improving outcomes for other patients. So, so, so far of the thousand um, paramedics and technicians that have been recruited, how many were recruited? in the last year? So we recruited over 200 uh, paramedics and over 200 technicians um, last year, and um, we are on track to deliver and recruit the same levels in the in the current year. Um, now, some of those technicians backfill the people then that become trained as paramedics and, and so on. Some of those paramedics then go on to become trained as specialist paramedics. So it's a, it's a, it's a career pathway that people embark on. And of course, some people want to step off the pathway at different points um, to the report recently that, that, that you obviously indicate that some of the paramedics are current technicians that are being trained up to be paramedics, um, but it was reported recently that those technicians are being replaced by technicians on a lower band and a lower skill level, I think it was at level three technician, so a lot of the existing technicians are being replaced by technicians that have a lower skill level than the current ones that are being trained up to be paramedics, is that the case? No, so so we have a uh, different uh, types of ambulance response depending on the clinical acuity of the patient. So what you might be referring to is that we um, introduced what we call low acuity ambulances to deal with those patients that don't require the skills of paramedics. Um, and those are being staffed by ambulance care assistants. But we've continued to invest um, in the double crewed accident and emergency vehicles and the skill mix there is paramedics and ambulance technicians. But the technicians that are being trained up, um, you talked about being backfilled, the technicians that are being trained up to be paramedics, are they being basically backfilled by the same the same level of skills as technicians? Yes, and, and indeed we're enhancing the, the, the skills of our, of our technicians as well. Okay. And obviously there will be a, a gap between the time it takes to train people um, up to the level that's required. Um, so what plans are being put in place to, to mitigate the current pressures on staff as you're training up these new, new technicians and new paramedics? Because obviously there's going to be a substantial gap between them starting and being fully qualified. Yeah, so it's a, it's a constant balance across the country and at a local ambulance station level to make sure uh, that we can balance out people's desire for further further career development and, and, and training and the need to maintain services as we as we go through that, that career pathway that I spoke about. So it's a comprehensive uh, workforce plan that covers the, the whole country. Local divisions, ambulance uh, divisions, are, um, um, the ambulance services is split into five operational divisions. Um, they determine what they need at a local local level based on their expected turnover and progression towards the, the workforce model that we've set out in the, the 2020 strategy. And we um, host um, different training opportunities in different locations across the country on an annual basis. Donald. Can I to the issue of cybersecurity, and in so doing, I'd like to refer to my register of interests and the fact that I'm on the board of two companies which invest in healthcare technology. Um, as has been discussed, the Scottish Ambulance Service was one of the health boards hit, and I think uh, you, you said that there was no operational impact and further that there have been no patient data impacted. Can you tell us categorically that no patient data was either lost or compromised following uh, the cyber attack within the Scottish Ambulance Service? Absolutely. There was, there was no patient data lost or compromised as a result of the cyber attack on the 12th of February. Uh, 12th of May, sorry. Thank you. Okay, can I turn then to the, uh, I think, well-documented issues that have occurred in the northeast of the country and in uh, Murray and in the, the north. Um, these have become evident in the last six months and I think they encompass a number of different problems, some of which have been reflected in <coughs> what we've discussed already this morning. 
Um, there have been, for instance, reports of insufficient numbers of paramedics in, in Aberdeen, uh, leading to a shortfall in staff. There have been um, reports of too many long-distance journeys uh, for non-emergency patients. Uh, there is also issues of staff fatigue caused by overwork and staff having to tie, take time off and the effects that ha has on the service. And lastly, I think it right to say that um, the Union Unite um, had a ballot and 95% of its members placed a vote of no confidence in the management of the North Division of the Scottish Ambulance Service. Can I ask simply, what have you done to address these serious issues? So there's no doubt that our staff are working harder than ever before. As we said right at the beginning, emergency and unscheduled care demand is, is increasing and the nature of services is, is changing. So we're working very closely with health board partners to understand the, the changes and to put in place safe and effective models of service delivery. So you'll be aware, um, for example, that we've um, in, announced an investment in, in Keith Ness in terms of additional uh, transfer resources. Uh, we're working very closely with NHS Grampian around um, changes in service provision in, in Murray M2. Um, um, and we've also, um, at the uh, staff partner's request, um, chaired by our employee director, who's a member of the United Union, uh, established an on-call working group so that we can look at issues of fatigue and remote and rural uh, working to try to, wherever possible, minimise on-call working in those areas. Um, can you point to any concrete changes on the ground that, that have occurred? So we've introduced a new urgent tier, what we call urgent tier ambulances in the, in the Murray area. In the last year, we've introduced hospital ambulance liaison officers to make sure that all the transfers are appropriate and we can task the most appropriate ambulance resource that we have available that meets the presenting conditions of the, of the patient at that particular point in time. And we've also introduced specialist paramedics uh, in, the, in the Murray area as as well and as we uh, demonstrated earlier on those specialist paramedics are able to see and treat and keep people in their communities in less need for transfer to hospital or transfer from hospital to another hospital. Um, there's also I think is it a logistics coordinator uh, could you explain the role of a logistics coordinator? Yeah, so these, these are based uh, within within divisions um, and they um, help in terms of making sure that consumables and vehicles and, and other equipment that people need to do their job um, are in, the, in the, the best place that they can. Paul, I don't know if you've got anything you want to, to add to that? Yes, yeah, certainly. In relation to things like restocking systems for um, stations, what we try to do is make sure that um, to minimise costs that supplies are ordered in bulk and are delivered centrally and then cascaded out in each division um, to those points. So Edinburgh is the central point for um, Lothian um, and we've got um, a logistics man in a van who then takes orders from the various stations and goes round and delivers that, making sure the stocks are in place, the cleaning facilities are in place, uh, medical gases and all those sorts of things. And obviously if there's anything that needs to be taken away, he does that as well. So rather than having ambulances traveling from A to B with paramedics and technicians on board um, doing these admin type roles, we have logistics personnel underpinning the system and supporting it to maxi maximize availability of our ambulance resources. Um, could I ask about a few specific things? The patient transport service, I understand that there's a, a, a paper that the board has in terms of uh, discussing the future of the patient transport service. Is that, could, the, could you make that available to us? Yes. Thank you. Um, and maybe briefly describe what plans you do have for the patient transport service. So... The patient transport service um, is skilled by ambulance care assistants um, who are able to care for patients en route to and from their hospital appointments. We've um, been refining that service over the last five years as part of a significant change programme um, and we've been identifying alternative providers uh, for those patients that don't need the skills of ambulance um, care, care assistance and working very closely with transport authorities such as Stra Strathclyde Passenger Transport for, for example. 
Um, we um, continue to refine the model um, as we as we go forward because, as you'll be aware, uh, the modern outpatients programme anticipates different models of outpatient appointments in the in the future. So we're working very closely with health boards um, to understand what that will mean for the patient transport service, and that's really the key thrust of the of the paper. What is it that we need to deliver going going forward? We've also introduced more discharge ambulances, um, and that always help people those help patients get back from hospital where they've been admitted for a stay. So the nature of the services is changing and we need to make sure that we continue to develop it as, as we um, anticipate these future changes. Okay, you, you provide us with that. Um, could I ask uh, the issue, the long running saga of meal breaks, has that been resolved? So we introduced um, a, a new Scottish system of ensuring that staff could respond to meal breaks several, several years ago uh, now. Um, and as we've introduced the new model, we've continued to refine um, the uh, arrangements for people to be disturbed during their, their, their meal breaks. Obviously, it's really important that staff do get their meal breaks and that when they are on a meal break, that we minimise the, the disturbances so that people can be appropriately um, rested. So we've been working with our trade union partners uh, and with staff over the last few weeks to try to refine those arrangements as we've introduced the, the new model. So that sounds to me like it's not resolved. It's, it's working and it's work in progress, um, and uh, everyone understands the need to ensure that we can respond to those immediately life-threatening patients when those calls come in. And two final things: he, he mentioned the skills mix earlier. Um, it's my understanding that, um, that there's, according to your skills mix, there should be a paramedic in each ambulance call. Uh, does that happen? So the, the skills mix will develop as we introduce the new clinical model. Um, so within our, our strategy, you'll see that there's different levels of skill depending on the, the nature of the of the call. And I mentioned the, the low acuity vehicles, for example, who often respond to GP requests for people to be admitted into, into hospital. So that will continue to, to develop. Where it's um, for whatever short notice call off, we can't get a paramedic on a particular vehicle, then we would make sure that that vehicle is tasked to appropriate call that meet the skills of that particular crew and we've got paramedics within the ambulance control centres that are able to offer advice and ensure that those resources would be appropriately backed up so there's safety netting um, in place. At the moment according to your the way you operate is it is it supposed to be that there's a paramedic on each call? Well, as I said, we're, we've introduced the first phase of the of the new ambulance response model. And so, we, or was that the previous situation? That was the previous situation. So we're now in a different situation, and that may not be the case depending on the call. Well, it will depend on the, the presenting conditions, and as, as Gareth said at the beginning, it's absolutely based on the best evidence that we've, we've got. And the final thing is, um, we saw in the media uh, highlighted where uh, ambulances were um, forced to stay off road where people... Um, there were um, ambulance crews were saying they were stranded at hospitals because there was no um, staff to receive them into the hospital, no emergency staff there, and the ambulance was in effect stuck with people in it or uh, with patients there and nowhere for them to go. Has that situation been resolved, or is that a, was that a, a one-off, or was it a regular occurrence? So hospital uh, ambulance turnaround times are very closely monitored uh, because it is really important that we can get patients handed over to clinical staff within hospitals and back out to respond to emergency calls when they, they come in. I mentioned earlier on that we had invested in hospital ambulance liaison officers. These are ambulance staff that work very closely with the, the site management team to try to pull patients through <coughs> uh, into the hospital and discharge patients as effectively as uh, as we possibly um, can. Uh, those um, hospital ambulance liaison officers operate in a number of the larger sites across Scotland and there are different models uh, where we're seeing um, real improvements in terms of um, hospital turnaround times such as the work here um, in, in Edinburgh through the, the Lothian Flow Centre uh, which um, is a, is a multi-agency um, hub uh, where we can make sure that we can um, get patients to the right place as effectively as possible. Paul, do you want to say a bit more about Lothian Flow Centre? 
Yeah, certainly. It's, um, it's been a number of years in its making, and it started off as a transport hub around um, looking at the integrated transport agenda, doing some really good work. Um, and certainly from an NHS Lothian perspective, they save ambulance resources only for patients who absolutely need them. Um, as we've now moved forward in relation to the floor centre, we have uh, paramedic embedded in the floor centre um, to make sure that we've got the multi-agency approach. Um, and what that does is it gives us the early heads up on reports of where patient floor needs to be facilitating additional discharges. Um, but equally, the pull through from A&E means that the, um, the local if you like, um, focus in relation to ambulance delays is not to delay ambulances and is to offload um, ambulances as soon as possible. And we're seeing um, the benefits of that in Edinburgh. Um, colleagues from other health board have been to visit the floor centre. Um, we are working in um, different areas with the local management teams to replicate that and to see what we can do in relation to making sure that we continue to improve on turnaround times where it's required. You could, um, uh, yeah, I think it'd be helpful if there's um, data to back that up, you know, the, uh, and if you could again provide that uh, to us as well. Okay. Uh, any final comments, Miles? Thank you, convener. I just wanted to, in terms of Donald Cameron's question, my own, I'd written down your response to the cyber attack, and in both. Um, you said following the attack, no patient data was lost. Could you just clarify that during it, no patient data was lost or compromised? Yes, yes, sorry, during and following, no, there was right. no patient data lost. Yes, sorry. Okay, thanks for that. Um, and thank you very much for your evidence this morning, and as agreed, we will now move into private session. Okay.